how do you diagnose intussusception? This is part two. If you watched part one, we went through what it is, what the pathophysiology is, what the clinical presentation is, but today, diagnosis. We're gonna get into the history. We're gonna get into the exam. We're gonna get into all of the different imaging modalities. If you wanna find out all about diagnosing intussusception, this is it, let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon and I'm here to get you comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating, and of course, on your exams. Today, diagnosing intussusception. So, you remember this picture from last time. This is ileocolonic intussusception. You remember this picture right here. Well, that is small bowel, small bowel intussusception. Which one is the intussusceptum? Which one is the intussuscipients? Little quiz there. All right, so the intussuscipiens receives the intussuscepttum, okay? And what is intussusception? How do we define it? That is when one piece of bowel invaginates into the intestine just adjacent to it. Now, like we talked about, that could come from this picture right here. So enlarged lymphoid follicles, which is common in children under the age of two years old, that's where we're gonna see intussusception most commonly, those pyres patches enlarge and act as almost a lead point pulling that ileum into the colonic. And so most commonly we're seeing this ileocolonic intussusception. We talked about other lead points. So polyps or cancers, foreign bodies, lots of different reasons. If you haven't watched that video, go check out part one, get comfortable with it, because today we're gonna to be talking about diagnosing. Now, at the end of that video, we did go through the clinical presentation. So, in really quickly going over that, so what did that look like? So, intermittent, progressive abdominal pain in a crying infant, drawing legs up to the abdomen. They may have emesis, usually non-bilious in the beginning, but can progress to bilious emesis when it becomes no more severe. You can have an abdominal mass, you can have bloody stool. We'll talk about this current jelly stool when we go in detail into the physical exam today. And when we thought about causes, remember, we went through idiopathic intussusception. We went through all of the different lead points like I just showed you. And of course, we went through the post-operative intussusception, which is rare, but it does happen. So you gotta have that high index of suspicion when you have that child post-operatively or even an adult who does have signs of bowel obstruction. Okay, so let's get into today diagnosing intussusception. What are the three key categories that we need to look at? Well, I talked about it a little bit earlier, and that was number one is the history, number two is the exam, and number three is imaging, all right? Now, what's missing here? Why did I not put labs into one of the diagnostic criterion for intussusception? Well, that's not because labs aren't helpful, and that's not because you don't need lab. But labs are going to not be so diagnostic for intussusception. Labs are going to help you give the clinical status of intussusception. So if you do have very progressed intussusception, you have a very sick child, you might see leukopenia, you might see more electrolyte abnormalities, signs of dehydration, or you might see a metabolic acidosis on that arterial blood gas. While labs aren't diagnostic in intussusception, they can be very helpful in helping you make that clinical assessment of that child. Now let's get into the history. When we're taking our history, and we're usually taking this from the parent, almost all children are gonna be complaining of abdominal pain. Now that is an intermittent pain. You have these episodes that are gonna have breaks of two to 10 minutes, okay, so intermittent, and this is that crampy, colicky type of pain that we would also see in bowel obstruction, okay? So intermittent, progressive abdominal pain in almost all children can be associated with emesis. Now we talked about this, so early in the course, there isn't much of a small bowel obstruction. Remember, this is ileocolonic. That's gonna happen very distally, and you have a lot of small bowel proximally, so they may not have emesis yet because the obstruction is so far distal, okay? That's why the pain is gonna be that first feature when the bowel is invaginating into the colon and we're starting to constrict that mesentery and lose that blood supply. 
Now later in the course, as the intussusception becomes much worse, we're gonna get that obstructive type picture, and then we might have bilious emesis. Okay, and that's later in the progression of this intussusception. Current jelly stools is something we see in about a third of patients, or up to a third of patients, and why do we see current jelly stools? Well, and why not just bright red blood? Well, the reason is because it's not an ulcer into the mucosa. The mucosa is becoming edematous. It's starting to slough off, and so you get that thick, mucus, bloody discharge that looks like current jelly, all right? And then finally in the history, you may be able to elicit lethargy. So if you have a child that is very, very sleepy, not interested, not interactive, not hungry, very lethargic, moving slowly, that is a child that is very sick and probably has very progressive intussusception. That child is gonna be one that has intestinal injury. And in addition, they may have bacteremia from that intestinal injury. They may have dehydration. They may be in a SIRS response, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. We talked about that in a previous video. And of course, they could be in sepsis or septic shock if indeed this intussusception is severe. Now, those are the highlights of the history of the intussusception, but you should be taking a complete history, specifically looking for sick contacts, previous illnesses, immunization history, any other reasons they could have a lead point, especially if that's an older child. So remember, you gotta take a complete history. Well, let's get to the physical exam. So what does the physical exam look like? Well, first, remember, all of my physical exams start with Chandler. So color, hydration, alertness, nutrition, disability, looking at the limbs, external support, and respiratory distress. So that's going to give you that sick, not sick picture. Now, some children will just be in pain, but otherwise, they pass that kind of Chandler observation pretty well, but you will get quite a bit of information from using that acronym. And of course, in a previous video, I talked all about Chandler when doing an examination of the abdomen. And in that video, I also talked about the way I take a pain history, which is that SRNOPD Sarah. Okay, so check that video out as well. Looking at the vital signs, you may have some tachycardia and tachypnea. On examination of the abdomen to light and deep touch, you may have tenderness in the right lower quadrant, but you could have tenderness in other parts of the abdomen. You may even have peritonitis, if indeed this is severe intussusception. And if you find peritonitis on exam, then you really have to be concerned about bowel ischemia, bowel perforation, and that may lead you going to the operating room. On examination of the abdomen, you have this sausage-shaped mass. Now, we talked about that trifecta, or that triad in testoception, which would be abdominal pain, a sausage-shaped mass, and that current jelly stool. And while we see that in less than a third of patients, they may have any of those things. So keep an eye out for that when you're doing a physical exam. Now, the last things to talk about, surgeons love to ask these eponyms, right? So what is DANCE's sign? Well, dance is sign is a retraction or emptiness in that right lower quadrant because of that intussusception, okay? So that's dance is sign. Other things you wanna look for is examining the stool, of course, for that current jelly stool. And then you wanna do a rectal exam, not necessarily a digital rectal exam, but you wanna take a look at the perineum and the anus to make sure you don't have intussusception prolapsing out of the anus, and that is definitely a possible and severe, very progressive intussusception. So now let's get to imaging. Okay, so in imaging, what is the most sensitive test to look for intussusception? Well, the most sensitive imaging modality for intussusception is right here. And what is that? Okay, well, this is ultrasound. And ultrasound is the most sensitive test. It also is low cost and it doesn't have any radiation. So very, very safe and it's very, very accurate. The sensitivity, specificity, right around 98%. Now, what do we look for on ultrasound? We look for that intussusceptum invaginating into the intussuscipients. And so on this ultrasound right here, you can see this is an intussusception and we can see this target sign. And so what is that? That's where you get these concentric rings that are alternating between echogenic, which is the mucosa and the muscularis, and hypoechoic, which is the submucosa. And that's those dark bands. And so we see these multiple bands alternating. That's the target sign. And that shows that we have a segment of bowel that is invaginating the intussusceptum is invaginating into that receiving intussuscipients. 
And so we have these two signs to think about. Number one is this target sign, which we described. Number two is this pseudo kidney sign. And that's where instead of taking the cross-sectional view on ultrasound, you take that longitudinal view. And that's where the intussuscepted bowel mimics the look of a kidney with the mesentery and then the cortex of the kidney itself. Okay, so two signs to think about in ultrasound. Now, there is one other type of ultrasound that I wanna bring up. I thought this was a good paper. I'm gonna put a link in the description below and that's contrast enhanced ultrasound. So contrast enhanced ultrasound is where you give IV contrast and then you use ultrasound as an imaging modality. This was developed in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but is used on a range of fun things in the abdomen. And it shows you really that good perfusion uh, to the bowel. And so when is contrast enhanced ultrasound useful? Well, it's useful if you do have poor perfusion of the bowel in a sick child with severe intussusception, that may avoid additional imaging and drive you straight to surgery. So it can be helpful in that equivocal or complicated case of intussusception. Now, moving from ultrasound, can we diagnose intussusception with a plain film? Well, this is a plain film right here of a child with intussusception, all right? And can you make the diagnosis? Well, let's talk about what you would look for. So, in plain films, you may be able to look, see that intussusceptum or an intraluminal mass. Don't see that here, okay? Second would be a mass or something obscuring the edge of the liver. That's also difficult to appreciate in here, and I don't see that in this x-ray. Well, you can see a non-visualization of the cecum, and so here, we don't necessarily see that cecum full of air, so this plain film could be concerning for intussusception, but certainly not diagnostic, okay? So plain films have a fairly low sensitivity when it comes to diagnosing intussusception. So while a plain film is not highly sensitive for intussusception, it can be helpful, it can show you air fluid levels in a child that has a bowel obstruction. It might show you a child that has fairly severe constipation. It can also show free air, and that might drive you directly to the operating room. So plain films can be helpful, but with intussusception, with the exception of these findings, they're not highly sensitive and certainly not diagnostic. Now, how about cross-sectional imaging? CT scan or MRI, okay? So you, you see this here, we got a CT scan of the abdomen, we have an MRI of the abdomen. Is this helpful? Well, yes, they can diagnose intussusception, but they come at fairly significant costs and they come with CT at a radiation exposure. So the bottom line is cross-sectional imaging should not be used in first-line imaging for diagnosing intussusception. Ultrasound is so sensitive without radiation and low cost that we shouldn't be routinely CT scanning our MRI in these children that we're working this diagnosis up. Now, if you have complicated case and you need additional information, that should be definitely at the surgeon's discretion working with the other members of the team in thinking about, is this actually gonna give me decision-making information? Now, there is one more imaging modality, but I'm gonna leave that till next time, and I want you to think about what could that be? What additional modality could be both diagnostic, but also therapeutic? Okay, so today we talked about intussusception. We reviewed that etiologies of intussusception, went through the clinical presentation, then really focused on the history, physical exam, and the imaging. We talked about how ultrasound is a preferred modality, very sensitive, and you're gonna see that intussusceptum invaginating into the intussuscipients, and you have that target sign and the pseudo kidney sign. We talked about how plain films can be helpful, but certainly are not diagnostic, and then we went through CT scans, MRI, cross-sectional imaging, certainly not the best modality. Okay, next time we're gonna be talking about treatment, and I'm excited about that. If you like this, give it a like, give it a share, subscribe to the channel if you find this stuff valuable, and of course, engage in the comments. I love it when you ask questions. So take it from here, study the videos, check out citizensurgeon.com. I got some helpful content on there with show notes, four important takeaways. Of course, as always, stay safe, study hard. I'll see you next time.